You know, and I, it, it's almost that simple, like being recognized by your peers, making something that's beautiful, making something that that really looks like team care about the design, about the place, about the organization. Yeah, we've done really innovative first, and we've done all these more innovative technical solutions. But I think the solutions are really about creating great experiences. They're not an end in itself. It sort of goes back to the idea of the name of the firm and lever, which is really a tool. So a tool that if you use intelligently can have immense power. But the tool is not the point. It's what you do with it for other people. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to sustainable building experts. Today, we talk to Thomas Robinson, founder and principal of Lever Architecture, on his journey into mass timber and his philosophy behind truly great buildings. Lever built America's first mass timber building sourced with domestic timber and is now home to their company offices. Thomas shared how mass timber is just part of the great and sustainable buildings equation, and he really dives into the importance of looking at each project holistically. This episode takes us a level deeper into the why and for who underneath the mass timber movement. Lever was named one of the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company. They also just recently won the design concept for the brand new Portland Museum of Art's $100 million expansion, where they plan to integrate mass timber. It's rare to sit down and ask someone their perspective about the industry who also got their master's from Harvard in architecture. Not to mention, Lever was the design team behind the 10-story mass timber shake table that recently completed testing only a few weeks ago. But before we jump in, if you like hearing sustainable building experts share their insights, stories, and experience, then please hit that subscribe button. So with that, let's get into it. Thomas, Lever's been involved with some pretty incredible projects in the past, currently all involving mass timber, uh, things outside of the mass timber world. What are you guys working on now that you're most excited about? I mean, a couple of projects, um, one that sort of stands out and it's kind of funny because it's in Portland, just not the Portland I live in, which is the Portland Museum of Art in Portland, Maine. And that was, uh, an international competition that started with like 110 folks, narrowed it down to four. And then we had this pretty intense, uh, competitive, like process while community well, series of lecture, Shonda Robinson partner was, was also incredibly, you know, le- had a lot of leadership in that. You know, it's, it's a project. It's this idea of doing a project, uh, mass timber museum, um, mm-hmm. that really catalyst for how we, how, how museums and arts places they're like, I think that that's one that's super exciting because it's a lot about how the decision you make about the building impact the larger community. Um, we're also, you know, doing a new art school for PSU, which is Portland University, which is right in the city. And this will be like the first purpose built arts building for them. It's at the hundred thousand square feet. So it's a really big deal for the school. And it's literally right, um, on the park blocks in Oregon. So right next to where we have the farmer's market. So it's a really important site. So that's uh, incredibly exciting. And then we're just starting construction on two library projects here in Portland. Uh, and the last, you know, um, you know, this is just Portland. We also have an office in LA. We have, uh, Albida one, which is an amazing portable housing project, which is part of the Albida trust restoring folks to, uh, what is really the, you know, um, center of the black Portland. And in LA, um, we're finishing up, which is the first, uh, kind of major cross laminated timber building in Los Angeles, it's a hybrid of steel and CLT, um, in Chinatown. And then there's another project for a, a universe and uh, not a university for a studio that we've worked for seven years, which is simply kind of coming out of the ground, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say that name of that project. So I'll leave it. Keep it in your back pocket. I well, yeah. if you can speak a little bit to the um the Portland Museum of Art in Maine, 
I mean, that's a hundred million dollar project from, I read it on your website and please, if people can go, they go to leverarchitecture.com and check that out. My question is as a, as an architect or a designer, will you, will you design everything and then go figure out who the mass timber supplier is and then go figure out who the GCs are and kind of sew the whole team up then? Or do you already like in a project like that, do you know who you're going to work with already? I mean, I think in that project, you know, one of the things that's key is seeing the project as a catalyst for changing how timber is sourced in the Northeast. And so we've started to have conversations now because the project's going to, you know, going to take years, uh, to really talk to folks that are really thinking about sourcing timber from New England forest in a sustainable way, you know, Maine at one time was, was one of the sites they were thinking about for a new CLT factor in Northern Maine it happened, but there's still a huge amount of interest, uh, in really thinking about you know, how these places can, uh, you know, utilize the resources that they have amazing resources. It's just putting the parts together. This project is part of it. And, you know, I, I, that's in order to do that, it's sort of like almost in a way trying to create person that you're the kind of team that you're going to work with. Uh, and that's something that gets us really excited is really, uh, you know, in a way pushing the envelope. Uh, so by the time we get the building, we have this, this new resource that other people besides ourselves on, on projects. The other project you mentioned, Albino one, I believe it was, that's like a, almost a hundred acre future project site that that's going in on. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. And it's, it's a timber, it's not like anything, um, incredibly innovative in terms of its structure, but it's a really innovative project, uh, in terms of Albina Vision Trust is this amazing organization that's really trying to rebuild this community that, uh, was in a way, um, freeway was put right through it. These sites were, um, uh, you know, claimed through eminent domain and the, and the community was in a way, uh, displaced. And it's like, well, how do you then bring that community back? And I think, you know, timber is a part of that, it's actually a stick frame building. And we do lots of stick frames too. Um, but I think, you know, as we get into that project, it's really thinking about, well, how can we sort of ramp up and, and think about issues around innovation and timber, like you know, like the building you see behind me, uh, at what's the next sort of generation of those. And then how does that connect to housing? How does it connect issues around equity? These are all really thorny issues that we're all trying to figure out. And I think, uh, what's been amazing about that project is it connects so many different folk, uh, in Oregon, um, in the city and I, I for the future, I mean, you know, you might've heard of the, uh, Phil Knight gave, you know, the 1803 fund, it's like a $400 million, um, you know, gift to like, think about how to rebuild this whole area. So it's a pretty exciting, uh, opportunity, you know, and, and, you know, we want to absolutely do the best we can to, to realize that it's something that's really, uh, inspiring. Yeah, I know um, Phil Knight and just that that whole name. They they give back so much. I mean that uh, the International Mass Timber Conference. Unfortunately, I didn't go to the tour to see the the huge states. You know, the new Nike Stadium, the Oregon yeah. Duck Stadium, but it looked impressive. But to speak about your office building behind you, because it sounds like that there was a, a couple funny stories and some threads with that. Um, yeah. That was an office before you were doing it before anyone really out there, right? Yeah, I mean, this project was done in uh, it's 2016, and we were working on framework at the same time, which is the U.S. Tallwood Building Competition. That, and at that time, a uh, um, friend or a friend approached us based on another project we'd done in Portland called Union Way, which is like a Parisian passage in front of the Ace Hotel and Pal's Books. And he walked through it, really liked it, called us up, and said, "Hey, I want to do a small." Cross-limited Portland site. And we're like, great, do it. 
Then he told me how much money he had for his fee. And we're like, okay, we're still going to do it. But, uh, we were like, okay, let's, let's, let's say if we are going to do this building with this new material, let's start with the material. We knew Dr. Johnson was involved, um, with piloting this, you know, cross laminated timber panel press they had at the end of their glue lamp line. And so we started to talk to them and at work out plan of the building based on the size of their press, um, 10 by 25. So we sort of optimized all the dimensions based on, so that was sort of the kernel that started it. And then we were able to really, you know, in a way, create an incredibly efficient structure. This is actually an all wood structure, which is in a way ironic because we haven't done one since then, uh, cause it has a plywood sheer wall core and we worked with them, uh, at a certain point we're like, Hey, we need to order the pants. <laughs> And they were like, Oh, wait a second. We got to get our certification. We're just about done. We're going to get it done. And we ordered them. And, uh, at that time, you know, they had never done this type of building before, but they, they typically didn't deal directly with architects, designers. So we were buying panels directly from them. And then we worked with an amazing, um, uh, individual who has had probably more impact on Mass Timber at Portland, anyone is Stefan Schneider from Cut My Timber, you may have heard of. And we worked with him to actually do the shop drawings. You know, we collaborated on putting all the, integrating all the parts together, their panel. Uh, they actually at that time didn't have a CNC press or CNC cutter. So all the panels were cut with pull saws, you know, by hand. <laughs> For everything you see above, it's all in a way hand cut, but we kept it really simple. We worked on you know, the material character of the CLT and, and it, and it, and it's just a great building. You know, people feel the care that went into how this building, it's something that, uh, when people started to come here and see it, they were, uh, they're like, Hey, this is, this is something that I think I could do, or I want to do. And, uh, that's something that, you know, you can't do again. So it was, it was really exciting to have that opportunity folks on this project. So your intro into mass timber, call it circa 2016, obviously, uh, that wasn't like a huge focus of your career prior to that introduction. What's keeping you focused and excited about this building material now? I mean, I think it was, uh, sometimes I, I make a kind of a. Uh, some of the models that I think about are almost culinary in nature. It's almost cooking. Like if you found this incredible creation and you're like, wow, you know, this hasn't really been, it's almost like rediscovering an amazing ingredient and then thinking mm -hmm. of it. Um, and, and I think that's been a little bit, the, the effort at this point is just like finding different ways that you can make better experiences using this amazing material. And. And I, that's what's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I came to Portland in 20, 2003 um, from Switzerland and I've been on the East coast and, you know, everything built out of timber, right? Unless it's like, oh, <laughs> so it's like, we have these big buildings that are built stick frame and it's really common. Uh, and you know, when, when we saw that potential for using like glue lambs and CLT were like, you have this amazing, you know, timber resource in Oregon, like the, you know, Southern forests in Oregon are one of the best places in the world to grow ferns. It's just like forestry is global. It's just perfect. So you have this amazing landscape with incredible species that grows, you know, in this environment. And then, then what's the next step? to connect it to, uh, people's lives in a way that's meaningful, right? You know, that you can actually see the timber mallet, you know, where it's coming from, you know, like I can look out here and see Mount hood and the range, and that's the same range this timber is coming from. And that's an exciting way to think about, you know, how we live each day. And it seems, well, it doesn't seem it's almost 
there's this tidal wave. It's just a revolutionary product, a building product where we can finally build sustainably. And we were just talking a little bit prior about how this was never a discussion about sustainability and like nobody talked about, you know, the the carbon footprint of like concrete. I mean, maybe there was a very select few amount of people, but how what are you even seeing out there like when you're when you're trying to develop and build and it's now it's almost like a standard conversation about you know the the carbon neutrality of mass timber. Yeah, I mean it's it's also it's a it's easy to say um you know, wood is good, but I would also say wood is, is, is better, but it can be really good if you understand where it's sourced, you know? So it's not all wood is, is sustainable, but I think what's amazing about it is it has the absolute potential to be incredibly sustainable. So it's like, you kind of have to, uh, that's why I was saying earlier, you just have to focus on like, you know, where exactly is the timber coming from? Uh, and what are the practices that uh, are being used, you know, for how that forest is managed, you know, and I think that's, and fortunately there's a lot of great work that's being done in that arena. Uh, and I think that has to be continually like uh, a focus for the folks that are in this kind of uh, space, because it's just, you know, I you know, because, and there, there's a huge amount of, there's a huge amount of focus on it. So we, we, we need to keep it real, you know, if we, and understand really, uh, you know, the larger picture of the supply chain. I think that's coming into focus a little bit more as more people are asking those questions. So I, I don't, it's a bad thing. Uh, I think it's, it's a really good thing that people are now focused on it and they're probably more focused on timber than even on concrete or steel in some ways timber gets the most amount of like uh you know um it, it just gets a lot of like a lot of eyes are on it right now so we have to make sure that being kind of true to you know how we manage these landscapes you said something before we recorded that really stuck with me you said i want to build great buildings and timber can be a part of that, but I'd rather build a great building with no timber than a less than stellar building with timber. Can you elaborate on what makes a building great? Yeah, I think it's more, you want a building that, that people have an affinity towards or in a way like feel comfortable in or move by, because those are the buildings that are going to last, right? You know, if it's something that doesn't work. Um, that's not functional, that people think uh, is, is not attractive, you know, it, it's probably not going to stick around. And I think that idea of durability is super important, but I think a timber building can be all that. And actually, I think you have an opportunity to have to do much more. I mean, uh, yeah, go to Japan, some of the oldest buildings in Japan are timber. Like there's 800 year old timber buildings, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they have the same kind of impact yes today as they did 800 years ago you know into the temple godas and all these things and i, I so there's there's something about uh, these older timber buildings or timber building in general that connects to us as human beings in a way that i think is is a little bit more elemental than other materials and i can't tell you exactly why but i i think everyone can recognize that there's something about that connection to this fact of timber is a living thing it comes from trees and people have this sort of biophilic connection to that. Um, if you can kind of experience it as a space. So I don't have the technical background. So a lot of times I have to forgive myself and the audience and say, I, I get asked stupid questions sometimes because not everybody does have that technical expertise that you do when you build, you know, let's say the, you know, the, um, the Portland, art museum coming up, how long does a project like that, or maybe even a project like that you're sitting in right now, how long should those projects last? And do you design them to last a specific time period? It's a really good question. I mean, you know, you would hope a hundred years, you know, at least, 
Uh, uh, definitely buildings are taken care of. You don't like last that long or more. It's like anything. <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, as long as you have, uh, all about, you know, the integrity of the shell. I mean, timber, like you say, if it's kept up can last 800 years, you know, mm -hmm. if the, if the integrity of the shell is kept, um, together and that's very much based on, on longevity of the culture that you're working, you know, uh, you know, I think in terms of, uh, you know, the idea of quality, that's just something that you really, as, as, as an architect, you really hope people see the care that you put into what you put together. I think, um, that's not true for every building and it can't be true for every building because some buildings are just much more seen as commodities than at places for people. But I hope we don't, you know, I hope we keep that in mind that sometimes paying a little more upfront, if you have a longer term vision is actually more economical than doing cheap. All right. And I think you could say the same for forest management. The reality is, is like, if we're, if we're managing forests on longer rotations, take some patience product you get at the end is, is better, actually has more value. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, are we able to like be that patient as a society, um, to actually allow for quality to happen and, and then that's having things last. Well, speaking about trying to tear something apart or shake something apart, you're, uh, you were put in charge of designing the famous 10 story shake table and we were talking uh, before this again, and you, you blew my mind because there was a, a professor by the name of uh, Schilling Pie, and, and I forgive me if I'm getting that wrong. Is is that right, Schilling <laughs> Pay? He was. You were talking about how they just underwent all of the tests, and that it was like going through thirty thousand different earthquakes. And this mass timber shake table, this mass timber building that you designed, is still standing tall. Uh, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. Cause it's, we're in really exciting times trying to push the envelope forward and this test just finished. I mean, it's just a matter of weeks ago. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I was just down in San Diego, like a little over a week ago, uh, and was talking with Shiling and you know, what he was saying, and I probably didn't translate it correctly when I mentioned it previously is like, you know, we were showing somebody from UCSD you know, the building and how there's almost absolutely no damage to the building that, um, the building's been through the equivalent of what would a normal building would maybe experience if it was in place for 30,000 years. So probably like 20, you know, 20, 30 earthquakes, you know, uh, major earthquakes with literally no damage. So no building in history has ever gone through as many earthquakes as this building. Uh, cause the, they didn't have buildings that, you know, um, that long ago of, of any sort of size or height. So I think that's exciting, you know, to be a part of that, uh, you know, we're the quote architects of the building. And it was sort of came out of our experience working on the framework project, the list of collaborators and scientists, engineers, and workators and contractors that have been involved with this is just like astounding, you know, and it's on it for seven years. So the tenacity to get to this point is, is pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, it's also like you get to the top there and it's like literally right next to top dot of Vermont. So it's like the jets are taking off and then there's this 10 story with timber tower out right in the middle and then this right around the base there. So it's sort of like this, uh, you know, place of innovation, which is really exciting to see. Speaking of the, you said you had work that evolved out of the frameworks project that went into the Neary 10 story shake table test. And part of that was your rocking walls, but you had then already had a design permitted, ready to go or through design process was already using the technology that's now just getting tested at this scale in 2023, back in 2016, 2017. Yeah. It's like 2016 and, uh. 
you know, we'd spend, we had a grant from, you know, it was a public private grant to do fire test and also the, the full scale seismic component, component testing to test a rocking wall system. Uh, and we went through that testing, didn't do a full scale 10 story version of it, but you know, we did enough to really demonstrate that this was a feasible, uh, structural system. So the whole building you now was permitted and designed with this rocking wall system. Uh, you know, unfortunately two things that were not really related to timber, they were actually related to, uh, tax credits for affordable housing, that project didn't go forward, but all the, all the testing, you know, the testing was used, um, both in, you know, the 10 story test, but also the fire testing, um, was used in the ascent tower project, Milwaukee had, you no. Know, so those are all like part of a longer arc of development, you know, we went through what's called a performance-based design or framework, which means is like, there's nothing, there's no code, uh, type for framework, but now the type four B is, you know, this temper. So, you know, a lot of the work we did, the firework and the fire modeling, it all sort of helped kind of push things a bit forward, um, relative to the new timber building codes people are using. So that's been fun to, you know, it's, I think it's almost like being a scientist in the field of buildings <laughs> where you're playing part and, in, and in, in changing the parrot and there's lots of people that are pushing forward. Speaking of pushing things forward, where do you see, uh, architects and mass timber coming together and kind of the evolution of those two, um, those, those two worlds. I mean, I think architects were integrators, you know, we know, uh, just enough about a lot of things to be dangerous. And I think our goal is to really try to bring all these different, uh, expertises together into something that is, you know, uh, beautiful has utility, you know, will last. And I feel like we can, we need to continue to sort of do that to be that role and, and also help develop new systems. I think, uh, it's, you know, the, the, the system called it framework because partially it was this framework of these systems. But if you look at like a lot of almost all the office buildings that you see today, it's usually a frame, single frame that is in series. And then we use the CLT as the sort of spanning element so that you don't only have columns and beams running one way. And that was what we developed for framework because after going through so many iterations of structure with engineers, we saw like, that is absolutely the most efficient and the simplest and also allowed us to just do one, um, fire test for that connection. So it was just that, kind of, uh, work, you know, has led to like almost a little bit of almost a standard frame type system that people use across the U S for these types of buildings. And I think, uh, what's been fun for us is sort of developing, um, the model that people will use and then they'll refine and then somebody will come along with something better. All right. I think, uh, you know, that's something we enjoy. Um, it's a challenge, but. So you've had the opportunity to work on all kinds of projects, mass timber or otherwise, uh, founded architecture firms and won international competitions. You've got a great large team that you're working with. What are some of the more, uh, impressive accomplishments that you're proud of, uh, that you think really kind of define your work over the years? I mean, I think, I think the be the best thing is when somebody comes and says, you know, I just really love this. Like, I like, I, you know, I just love being here. It's like, that's the thing. It's like, uh, you know, especially on my peers, it's really nice when, you know, somebody says, you know, I just, I really love that building. It, you know, and I, it, it's almost that simple, you know, like being recognized by your peers, um, making something that's beautiful, making something that, that really looks like team cared about the design, about the place, about the organization. That's probably the highlight, uh, 
um, that I'm most proud of. I mean, yeah, we've done really innovative first and we've done all these, um, sort of more innovative technical solutions, but I think the solutions are really about creating great experiences. They're not sort of, a, uh, an end in itself. I mean, you know, it sort of goes back to the idea of the name of the firm and lever, which is really a tool. So a tool that, you know, if you use intelligently can have an immense power, but the tool is not the point. It's what you do with it for other people. I like that. For people starting out in, in their career, you know, they're trying to be architects. You went to Harvard, which is unbelievably impressive. And I, is there any words of wisdom that you have for other people starting out in their fields to kind of get where they need to go? I mean, I didn't plan Harvard. I had no, um, I mean, I honestly, you know, when I, um, you know, when I was, I went to Berkeley as an undergrad for architecture and it was the only architecture school I got into. <laughs> so I was like, so excited to get into an architecture school. Uh, and so that's where I ended up, you know, I didn't get into Cal Poly cause, um, I was growing up in California and I just was incredibly interested and passionate. It's like, I was very lucky to find something where I just, okay, this is something I really love to do. And if you find something you really love to do, it will show. And then that leads to other opportunities. And, and I think for Harvard it was just like, I needed to kind of, uh, I was very fortunate to go there. I was a little older, so I'd worked you know, for six years, which was a long time, I was a licensed architect and I said, no, I really need to like try something new. And it was a great experience because I think I had a lot of perspective. I was married at the time <laughs> and just really had an amazing professor had, uh, that were there. I had Peter Zompor, who's a great Swiss, um, architect who was a professor there. I got to know him and, uh, you know, so it was really, uh, that kind of opportunity, but what I would sort of say to people is just, if you love what you do, it'll show. And then wherever you end up, you know, you'll end up, you know, and I think, uh, uh, I would also say it's like this idea of tenacity. If you, if you really want to do something, you may not get it the first time. You might have to try more than once, <laughs> you know, and I, uh, you know, that's that's sort of the, probably the most important thing is don't, don't let like, if you want to go to Harvard, you might have to, you know, apply more than once or you decide different ways that you want that particular thing. I'm not talking Harvard, uh, is the thing. I just think it's like, you know, what do you want to do? And, and then just go for it. And even failing in doing what you want to do will lead you to something that's as interesting as what you failed to get. <laughs> Completely agree. What about for people that are maybe a little bit farther along in their architecture career? They're not new graduates. They're not, you know, first year associates. Maybe they're looking to take that leadership position, or maybe they're looking to go out and start their own firm. What advice would you give to them from a leader's perspective? Who's done that? Uh, you know, it's like, you know, people say, oh, you know, I woke up when I was 10 and I was starting to <laughs> Um, I knew I loved building blocks, thing, building things, but no, like lever in a way started because, um, we hit a huge recession at the firm it was at I myself, like, wow, okay, what am I going to do now? You know? And so I thought, let's give this a go. And, and I was very fortunate, uh, you know, to be able to have one or two people that believed in me and said, Hey, you've done a great job here. I know you can do this. I think, I think on the, and I think that's what I would say to some of the folks that are maybe a little older is like, it's not just about delivering project. It's sort of how you create a relationship with, um, anyone you're working with, like from the, the person who runs the 
show to the person installing the, the sprinklers. <laughs> and, and, you know, people start to sort of all those sort of interactions kind of, uh, build up and you know, just taking the time to like really try to help people do their jobs better or show what it is you're trying to accomplish and, and just being tenacious and respectful. I think that's really, you know, how things happen for, for us. I think we're a little bit different in that or a firm of our age, like we immediately just got into building buildings, <laughs> you know, like our first, you know, I didn't, I found I didn't have work and randomly got a call from a former client. They said, Hey, got this project, 85,000 square foot, got renovation of a building in LA. You'd be perfect for it. I'm like, okay. You know, and that was our first major project, you know, when there was like two or three of us. So it's like, we had a little bit of that kind of like, you know, it's only recently after 13 years that we're doing houses, you know, we're kind of like, you know, and, and uh, so there's that art, but I just think, I mean, I, I, you know, it's a long way of answering your question. It's just like, just do good. Just really work on whatever you're doing to do it in the absolute best way that you can do it. And if you keep doing that, it'll, it'll pay off, you know? You know, I was a little older when this thing, these things started and that's okay. We asked LinkedIn if there'd be any questions that somebody would like to ask. And there was a, a question by the name of uh, Jay Young and he's an architectural designer. And he asked, oh, what are some cha challenges that you faced in your career and how did you overcome them? So that might fit in well when you're trying to get lever up and going or some uh, challenges that you faced. Yeah, I mean, we started and I think, uh, you know, it was, we hired, uh, you know, first person here, uh, individual named Doug Sheets. He's still there sitting behind 13 years later. And then, uh, and then the most terrifying thing, we hired a second person and we're like, oh my God, that's terrifying. And then, um, we had this project and then. You know, we were going along with a friend of mine, this developer, and then the whole thing just like exploded and died. <laughs> and I was like, like, what am I going to do? You know, and, uh, I was riding my bike home and call, you know, from sitting under the bridge, I think the Burnside bridge of Portland. I was just like, so I should stop and take this. I know this guy. And he's like, Hey, you know, I heard that you're, you know, on your own doing your own thing. We have this project, and that was the project that I just mentioned there for firm off. This was in 2009, you know, like right in the depths, not a good time. So it's sort of like that's what I'm saying is like, kind of have to have this optimistic faith that something will pop up. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to go in a different direction. I think, I just think, don't, what I would sort of encourage folks to do is, is, even like we lost a competition, but we developed a lot of muscles that we use to win the next one. You know, I think that you just have to kind of out there, uh, do your best and it will sort of evolve into, you know, what your life is going to be and, and okay to just, uh, you know, okay to be that you now. I, and I, I think. You know, we're all not going to be, um, Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> you know, there's different levels of talent. There's different levels of fame. Uh, that's okay. You know, you know, we're not all going to be frankly, right. But you can be really good at what, uh, and you can, those choices on how you go about it. Speaking of persevering and, you know, moving on and always striving for to make sure that you're getting out of life, you know, what you're striving for, uh, a blast from the past reached out on our LinkedIn profile from somebody that was part of one of your very first projects. He's bringing it back. Pete Cobell wants to know when you guys are going to build a brewery together. I'd love to do a brewery. The problem is, is I think, uh, you know, like, 
a temper brewery, I don't know, I've talked about it, might not be the greatest thing because, uh, you know, there's an issue about yeast and beer and got to like hose everything down with like super hot water. <laughs> it's not the tasting room, probably in Denver, you know, the brewery is kind of tough. Though I'm sure they have them and they probably have really tasty beers in the Middle Ages because of that, because it was all wood. Um, but the story with that project is I was like really young, like 23. Uh, and firm I was working for, um, the principal there, this guy named Joe Eschereck, an amazing architect, he was a World War II veteran. Um, he got a call from one of his friends, uh, who ran an ad agency and said, Hey, I have this crazy client who wants to build a brewery, uh, independent brewery and I want to build it in Montana. And I think you could help me on this. And so the client came. San Francisco, I spent like, got a sketch from Joe, drew up the thing in the afternoon. And then we flew to Montana that evening, uh, and up his dad in Portland, Oregon. First time I've ever been to Portland, <laughs> was there for about 10 minutes. Then we flew to, uh, they chartered a plane and flew to the Whitefish. And then we presented this design town council. That evening. It was just a crazy thing. And then, and then eight months later, we built this brewery. Um, Pete Cobell was the head brewer of this pilot brewery. <laughs> and so that's how we got to know each other. I was just a young kid. Uh, and Pete was a fair bit younger than he is now, but a little older than me. And I think weirdly, because he was in Montana, then that got, you know, he got involved with Crossland Timber, you know, so this whole thing, and then it kind of came to each other in Portland. Um, so that was, uh, you know, the story there, but I, but I'm always, uh, I think it's not that far off because it's just beer is kind of this agricultural product, like timber. You're taking these sort of things like wheat, malt, you're technically combining them in a way to create something, uh, just like the glue lamps you see above us. It's there's chemistry it's structure. There's a lot of that. So, and ideally it's great. Tastes good at the end. Switching gears a little bit because uh, Pete's a great guy. We're going to have him on the podcast and, you know, he's doing some serious things in the mass timber world. And he kind of, I, th yeah. I thought there was an inside joke with that. So thank you for sharing. But you have done a really stunning project. One of the coolest projects I got to say that I've seen is the, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, the Leangelo Estate Winery. Wow. What, did you have a, um, a say in that, or was that some of your other team that designed that? Oh, yeah. No, that was definitely, um, like that, that's probably a kind of personal favorite for me. Yeah. It was a big deal and gorgeous and, you know, similar, like we did this project called Union Way, which was all line hybrid poplar and the owner of that walked through it and he just like feel of it. He said, you know, I know you haven't done a winery before, but you know like to it's tasting but uh yeah for so that was you know that project uh kind of a touchstone for lever in a way and it's a little bit about regional sourcing or a lot about you know, this is a it's a new winery and they don't irrigate you know they're very much about working in the vineyard what you know and they work on the vineyard and that's really character of the wine it changes here and i think they wanted a building that was really expressive of what is a what is the architecture of a winery you know 2000 2000s or 2015 you know what is that architecture today based on uh something up this place that kind of region and so you know all the glue lamps that we sourced were all from Douglas fir, you know, harvested in Oregon, made in, um, uh, you know, one of the towns where they have a small glue lamp manufacturing facility. And typically those glue lamps, they use them for headers and, and, uh, residential it's that size. So it's a, it's a very sort of, uh, common size and they're really. Expensive. So I think all the timber in that roof was like 16,000 
Oh, wow. You know, but then it's like what you do with it. Um, so it's actually, you know, it's got this sort of steel structure that all the timber beams hang from that gives it this sense of, of, of almost like one of the oaks you see in the Willamette Valley that has this cantilever and you're like, how does that work? <laughs> and that's really, I think the magic about architecture is it's not always revealing everything, but it has a sense sort of, uh, it, you know, like if you go to it, you feel it, right? It's not like intellectual. Like you've been to that wine and you sort of feel that space and you remember it. You can tell in your answers, especially to that last question, there's so much thought, so much critical thinking and so much awareness that goes into these projects. Where do you go to learn about your craft? Where do you go to stay abreast of the things that the architecture community is doing and learning? You know, I probably, the, I learned the most when I was just traveling as a, you know, uh, in like getting out of school, I, you know, I didn't, I got out of school and then I started working pretty much immediately. Uh, I didn't at that time have the money to travel, but then at a certain point, I think it was around nine five, I just wanted to go abroad and. I worked in Berlin for a while, you know, lived really cheaply and then just traveled around Europe, um, uh, Scandinavia, all these areas and, and just spent time visiting as many places as I could possibly. And I think that, uh, and the same with the U S I traveled, you know, by car around the United States, but just like seeing things, um, going to museums, just like having these experiences, they all kind of stay with you you now. And, and I feel I've been drawing on that experience pretty much for the work since that time. I was also super fortunate to, uh, work in Switzerland, um, for Herzog of Demeron. And I worked on the Dion Museum in San Francisco and just being in Switzerland, living there. And just have being exposed to this completely different kind of material culture out in Switzerland and the way they think about making things, the way they craft had a profound impact on like, could we do something that is like that here? We can't do that it here because we don't have the same culture, just like, you know, Italian food that's not cooked in Italy. Italian food in America is different than Italy, right? I mean, you can't yes. like, it's, it's sort of a bull's errand to try to like do exactly the same. I have to cook up the place, right? And, uh, but I still think it's interesting that kind of cultural connection. So I, you know, to sort of go back to your question, it's like, that's a huge part of it is that sort of connection to place. Uh, I also, I'm, in, I'm, su I'm, you know, incredibly connected to nature as a source of inspiration. I, like I said, I grew up, you know, on the beach in California since I was 10 and it was just like this incredible beauty of the ocean, the beach, the forest the cliffs, you know, the, the different types of, uh, trees. And, and, and I think that's similar in the Northwest is like, if you just like, open your eyes, even in Portland, even with all the issues that you know, we have today in Portland, just look at the trees in Portland. <laughs> They're just mind blowing. And you just have to look at them. But most of the time we're not looking, we're just like kind of just getting about our business. But if you stop and look at the world, most of the time, that's all you need. All right. I have to ask then, with all your travel, what's a couple, one, two, three favorite places you've been? And then maybe like a top museum that just blew you away. Yeah. Um, I went, <laughs> I always have a, I always have a desire to go north for some reason. <laughs> so, um, when I was in Scandinavia, I was just like, well, how far north do I get on my rail pass or whatever? I was just like, oh, and I went to, um, Lofoten islands, which are off of Norway. And there's an island called, oh, it's just an A dot on the top of it. And. Uh, it, you know, you take a boat, get out there and it's the land of the night sun. 
And uh, it's also, there's a very famous poem po, called The Maltrap, the story of these whirlpools, northern Atlantic, where people would pop down. And, oh, be shame. Now, and so, yeah, Graham Poe is very, uh, you know, melancholy kind of horror type thing. But that place is just so far north. And I think it's, it's a little bit more overrun now when I was there in the mid nineties, but you know, Northern Norway, and there isn't really any architecture. It's just the, the architecture of the place with the towns, and the mountains and the ocean. It's just so spectacular. So that's, you know, on the kind of far North, I love that. The other, you know, maybe more culturally, I love Rome and that's a, it's a little bit of a trope. Um, but every, every time if I have the opportunity to go there, I could just be happy there myself, walk around for like two. And that's what I sometimes done that once. I don't really need to just, it's a place you could just be as a city and the building Pantheon is, uh, you know, just a, this sort of magical place where I can remember each time I visited and what was going on because it's so strong character of the place. So those are just two, uh, you know, there's lots of others. I mean, I, I think in the West, the things that are most in a way sublime are the landscape, not necessarily the architecture. You know, I mean, we have some great buildings, but it's really like, it's hard. To, <laughs> even if it was a great skyscraper, it's like, then you have a mount. It's like, you know, imagine like there was like New York city and then there's like, uh, you know, um, Rainier, right? <laughs> it's sort of like, whatever, what's, what's more impressive right? in a way. So I think that's a little bit the, the difference of being sort of in the West is the architecture is sort of, it's like kind of trying to, um, work with the landscape that can never, um, in a way overshadow it. Uh, you know, I think there's different types of martial arts. Like I talk about architecture, but different types of martial arts. <laughs> like I'm, I'm most akin to like Aikido, which is like, you kind of got to take the force that's being thrown at you and redirect it. Uh, and I think that's the force of nature, the landscape in the West, you have to sort of try to take, redirect it in a way that's more positive as opposed to like, like New York is way more Kung Fu. No, it's just like. You know, they're just going <laughs> to take you down. You know, I mean, the, each building is kind of competing, right? To be the tallest, the most visible, uh, the most aesthetic. It's more of like a, you know, full on like fight, you know, and on the streets of Hong Kong, right? So it's a little different. <laughs> at least, at least the way I see it. Yeah, I love that answer. And I, I really appreciate you talking about drawing inspiration from nature you know, working with the landscapes, you know, I, as much as I love seeing mass timbers and, uh, mass timber used in buildings, you know, the mountains will always win, uh, in my mind, if I'm choosing where to spend time, uh, you talked about drawing inspiration, uh, and education from nature. Is there a person or a mentor that you've worked with that you would say kind of helps shape your way of thinking? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, Joe Escherich, who, you know, he was an older, you know, at that time, an older architect, but I think his, uh, he was really confident what he was able to kind of bring to architecture, but he was also very sort of open and, and patient with, with something like myself, who was sort of a younger architect that really didn't know who he <laughs> You know, we didn't really, I didn't really like, go, oh, wow, this is this amazing architect. I hadn't done all the research, but he was just patient with me. You know, you could see that. I'm sure he wasn't patient with everybody, but he was patient. He would answer my questions that might be questions that a young architect would ask. If you weren't an architect, what would you do? <laughs> you know, things like that. Oh, when you're, uh, and. So he, he had a real influence just in his way. Uh, I think in terms of, uh, just thinking about design, 
you know, Peter Zumtor, you know, we had him as a studio professor and we actually really got to know him. And then I got to spend time with him when I was in uh, Switzerland at Hertha Kamran. And, you know, we would, my wife and I would go and he really wanted to play tennis. <laughs> so we'd go play tennis and then we would sit down and chat. I think he was, so it's just, and seeing how he thought about design and, uh, how he thought more about, uh, a narrative of experiences as opposed to necessarily solving, uh, problems, uh, or creating technical innovation for innovation's sake. He cre created the innovation to solve an experiential problem or create a particular type of atmosphere or space. And the deal was started that, and then that brought the kind of technical, uh, you know, chops to bear to solve that. So I, no, that was super, uh, a super influential mentor for me. What about any podcasts, books? you know, stuff like that that comes to mind, maybe early in the career or more recently that you've seen even shows something. You know, I, I love Michael Pollan, like omnivores to that dilemma. You know, I mean, I think he, and he, you know, he's just, so I'm just thinking one of the books I'm up and how to change your mind, but I think he's so, uh, uh, lucid on the material world. You know, he takes things that people overlook. And, and by looking at them closely, they become, uh, incredibly relevant, you know, to the society or it's like, he can take, you know, a subject like, you know, baking bread and turn it into something that seems like, uh, we should all like change your life. <laughs> so I think those kinds of like insights into simple things. I think are the, are the, the kind of pieces that I excited about, you know, I'm not, uh, here I am on a podcast. I'm not a, um, I'm not a, you know, big podcast listener, I think, cause I get really excited just about sometimes, sometimes I'm so busy. I just want to stop and I just want to be where I, you know, and not have any time of input, but you know, I, there's amazing, uh, one amazing sort of resource that people might know is this podcast called Slowdown. you know, and, uh, where, uh, they interview artists and go into depth on in their lives and how they sort of fall, you know, as they are today. So it's just those sort of in-depth discussions with an individual how they've sort of evolved over time. I find really fast the biographies, you know, we're sort of doing podcasts or I mean, short little bite sized biographies <laughs> and, uh, you learn a lot. I mean, it's like, uh, some of the most amazing books I've read, you know, uh, one of the, my favorites is the great bridge by David McCullough. Uh, it's his first book. And it's the story of the building of Brooklyn Bridge. And it's like, tap. you know, uh, so those are kinds of like that idea of like that stories are some are things that I get fired by. Like, cause you'd think it's just like, oh, wow, this amazing bridge or product or whatever. Oh, they just had it all figured out and realized just barely made it. Yeah. And it makes you feel a little bit better where, uh, where, where you're at, learn some of the things that, you know, from both, cause it's not, it seems like history just continually repeats itself, uh, in some ways. And I hope you can learn a little bit from the folks that come. <laughs> yeah. Those are, those are great answers. Um, fully appreciate everything you just said. Big Michael Pollan fan big fan of being present or at least trying to be more so, um, and, and just really sitting in, in the environment where you're at and, and taking it all in. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, before we ask our last question, 
Where can people connect with you? Where can people connect with Lever? I mean, you know, our website, leverarchitecture.com, uh, you know, we have info at leverarchitecture.com. You know, you can send me an email at thomas at leverarchitecture.com, but I can't promise you what the response. Um, but you know, it's never know where that are interested to come in. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's really, no, I think, I think that's sort of where we start. The uh, got a great team. Well, it's not just, and we've had many of them in here since the very, so. Yeah. We'll make sure that we direct people in the, in the appropriate direction. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've talked about a lot of different topics, a lot of different subjects, uh, teamwork, leadership, education, projects, all of that taken into, into the lens here of this question. If you had the power to wave a wand and change one thing about the architecture world, what would you change and why? It's, it's really not really about change but really about the way we think about what we do as architects, uh, in that, you know, the decisions that we think are maybe just every day are not, you know, the decisions we make about materials we use, you know, where we buy them from, who actually, you know, buys them, who puts them in, who does the work. Uh, they're really deeply connected to, you know, the world as a whole, and that connections, both in terms of, uh, economics, you know, we decide to buy something that's purchased somewhere else. That money goes there. They're connected to, you know, issues around equity, uh, connected to issues around, uh, long-term sustainability and climate change. And, you know, and also connected issues around like our culture in terms of beauty. And I just think changing the way, uh, we think about what we're doing is probably as an, is, is really the change that will to these other sort of changes, you know, we can only really change what we do, right. To a certain extent. And that, that influences others to think differently and then that has the potential to really create, you know, crew change. Well, we appreciated the journey, especially how Lever was originally born. I mean, it was in um, more of like a depression and kind of what's going to go on and you failed forward. And now Lever was named one of the world's most innovated companies by Fast Company. And it was a pleasure talking to you. We're excited to see what your projects have for us in the future. And it's a small world out there. We'll definitely see you around. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thomas.